Well, for my midlife crisis, I got myself a motorbike. And I also got a high-vis jacket. But my wife says to me, you cannot wear that jacket. I said, why? It keeps me safe. And she says, because you look silly in it. And I said, but it keeps me safe. And then she said, well, it was about safety. Why would you get the motorbike in the first place? I hate it when they use logic like that. I was afraid of an accident. She was afraid I would look silly. And we all have a lot of things to be afraid about. In summer, we had the bushfires where it wasn't safe to be at home. And now we've got the coronavirus where it's not safe to leave home. And there are even more things to worry about. The bushfires were just the wake-up call that we've got to be worried about global warming. With AI coming, our jobs aren't safe. And also, with the ups and downs of the economy, even our businesses aren't safe. So welcome to tonight's topic. We're talking about fear of the future. And I'm going to answer, should we be afraid of the future from the perspective of a dad, a doctor, and a theologian? So here I've got three things to say. The first thing is this. Yes, we should be afraid of the future because fear is a good thing. Fear is good. Fear is what keeps us alive. When we evolved, we learned to be afraid of the saber-toothed tiger. We also know that young people get themselves killed because they're not afraid enough. But at the age of 25, the prefrontal lobe kicks in and we learn to have a healthy fear and fear keeps us from doing dumb things. We also have the fear performance curve where fear makes us do things, especially because we're afraid of the future. It's fear that makes us study for exams. It's fear that makes us save for the future and it's fear that makes us look after the environment. And fear also gets us to do things. Psychologists say we convert fear to excitement, threats to opportunities, and we finally do what we should have been doing all along. We leave the toxic relationship, we quit the job, and we start a career for ourselves. The Bible has this interesting thing to say. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Somehow to be afraid is to be wise at the same time. Well, how does that work? Well, I like to go surfing like once a week. And my friends say, well, how can you go surfing? You're Asian. And I know because when I watch Bondi Rescue, it's always an Asian getting rescued. But I say, well, unlike those Asians, I have a healthy fear of the ocean. And it's a fear of the ocean that gets me in tune, in rhythm with the ocean. And it frees me up to enjoy the water, to go surfing. And the Bible says it's the same with God. There's a God who loves us, who made us, who saves us. And there's a healthy fear of this God that puts us in tune, in rhythm with God and the universe. And it frees us up to enjoy this life. So yes, fear is a good thing. But the second thing I want to say is this. Often our fears are poorly calibrated. So somehow we're very bad at prioritizing our fears. So when I was a kid growing up in Adelaide, in the 1970s, it was actually legal to smoke everywhere. You could smoke in a restaurant. You can smoke in a doctor's waiting room. And of course, you could smoke in a plane. So my parents were boring, and they used to sit in the back section of the plane where it was non-smoking, but the front section of the plane was smoking, and as soon as the plane took off, you could see the cloud of smoke coming to the back section, which was non-smoking. I used to wonder to my parents, why bother? But think about it. In the 1970s, many of us were afraid of flying. We were all afraid of a hijacking. That's why we let them x-ray us and pat us down and search our bags. But we should be more afraid of the cigarette smoke. And that's because as human beings, we have a hard job calibrating our fears. We know alcohol kills way more people in Australia than, a, than snakes do, but snakes are unknown, whereas alcohol is known. We all know way more people die in a car accident than from a shark attack, but we can control cars, but we can't control sharks. We all know way more people die in a heart attack than in a terrorist attack, but there's something horrendous about a terrorist attack, whereas there's something mundane and boring about a heart attack. So as human beings, we have a hard job calibrating our fears. So how should we prioritise our fears? Here, I like the work of Peter Sandman, who's an expert in risk communication. 
And he says, as humans, we understand risk or danger as a relationship between what our heart tells us and what our head tells us. So with alcohol, our heads say, hey, this is something we should be worried about. But our hearts say, nah, it's all right, have another one. And so here we're too calm when we should be more alarmed. But then with sharks, our heads say, hey, it's all right. They're more afraid of you than you are of them. But our hearts say, no, 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 this is a horrible way to die. So here we're alarmed when we should be calm. So Peter Salmon puts it this way, the risk that upset people are completely different than the risks that kill people. The things that kill us don't alarm us, but the things that alarm us won't kill us. We're very bad at calibrating our fears. But then we come to unique situations like the pandemic of the coronavirus where our hearts tell us, I think there's something horrible going on here, and now our heads don't know what to do. Because on the one hand, our heads say, hey, let's be rational, let's be calm, we don't want to overreact, we don't want to become hysterical, we don't want to become chicken littles. But on the other hand, our heads are saying, no, I think we do need to react. Something needs to be done, more needs to be done, and it needs to be done sooner rather than later. So when it comes to pandemics, Peter Salmon just last week had this statement, we are torn between the intuition that we're not doing enough on the one hand, and the embarrassed fear that we might be doing too much on the other hand. So how do we stay calm? How do we stay, or when we, how do we know when to be calm? How do we know when to be alarmed? And how do we know when we're doing too much or we're not doing enough? Here I like what Jesus says. He says, do not worry about what you'll eat or drink or what you will wear. Then he also says, Look at the birds of the air. They don't store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than them? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Jesus is saying, hey, think about what we can control. Control what we can control, but there's a God who controls everything, and we can leave what we can't control into God's control. Jesus is saying, just he's not saying be apathetic. Don't do what we should be responsible for doing, but just realize how much we can control and there's a God that controls everything else. And here I like what the Christian saying is, peace is not being in control. Peace is knowing someone else is in control. But then Jesus flips around and he says, you know what? If you want to worry about things, there's something we really should be worried about. And it's this. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In the same way, we might say, hey, don't worry so much about the sharks. Worry about the heart attack. Jesus is saying, don't worry so much about your body by itself. Instead, worry about your soul and its destiny as much as you worry about your body. And this brings me to the third thing about fear. And the third thing about fear is this. What is of ultimate value in my life? Fear finally forces us to ask this question. When we travel to dangerous places, often we like to bring a fake wallet with us because we can let them steal the fake wallet. Because really, the wallet is not what is of value. They can have the wallet. We can lose the wallet. That's okay because this is what has value. We don't want to lose that. So fear really is a fear of loss. What can we lose? What can't we lose? These are my three boys. And I like to tell them, boys, 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 you know, chances are when you grow up, you'll be just like me. So chances are when you grow up, you're going to be very short. You're not going to be very good looking. So your only chance in life is to study as much as you can and make as much money as you can. And of course, that's a joke. That's a joke. But it's funny when I tell that in my Chinese church, no one laughs because I think, is he joking or is he serious? I think he's serious because that's what I tell my own kids. No, it's a joke. But fear exposes what is of ultimate value. What do I want for my children? Do I want them to be rich? Do I want them to be successful? Or do I want them to be loved? What is of ultimate value in this life? This is Robert Waldinger in the most watched TED Talk of all time. And here he asks this question, what makes a good life? And he quotes a Harvard study that he did 
where he traced the lives of over 70 men over a period of more than 70 years, and they asked the question, what makes a good life? And they found in the lives of these 70 men over a period of more than seven years that what led to most happiness was not whether you had a million dollars or not. It was not whether you were a CEO or not. It was not whether you had paid off your house or not. It came down to quality of relationships. So in the end, the most important thing in life isn't what we own, it isn't what we've done, it's who we have in our life. That is the ultimate value. And then Robert Waldinger quotes Mark Twain, there isn't time, so brief is life for bickerings. Get over those little things. There's only time for loving, and even then, just for an instant. So we need to double down in these uncertain times on relationships. And then how much more than our relationship with our Heavenly Father, God, the God who loves us, who made us, who saves us. And if we can have a rich, flourishing relationship with this God, then we will enjoy shalom and peace in this life. Jesus says this, but seek God's kingdom. Be right with God. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. That's in God's hands. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So our question today was fear of the future. Should I be afraid? And I just want to give a nuanced answer. Yes, we should be afraid because that makes us take responsibility for what we should take responsibility for. But secondly, at the same time, we need to know how much we can control and really how much we can't control. And finally, it makes us ask the question, well, what am I afraid most of losing? What is of ultimate value in my life? I once sat next to a guy who I had met before at a dinner, and he told me that he had just become a Christian this year. And I said, really? How did you become a Christian so late in life? And he said, well, it all came down to the GFC. His business partner lost everything in the GFC. He lost his house, he lost his car, he lost his job, but somehow he was still okay. So this guy was intrigued, because he knows if he had lost his house, his car, his job, he would have been destroyed. But this guy was okay. And this guy said, well, those things weren't of ultimate value to me. In the end, I have a faith in a God who loves me, who made me, and who saves me. And this God is always there for me. So this made this guy who I was talking to take stock of his life. You know, I need that too, because things come and go. I too need a faith, a God who loves me, who saves me, and who made me. I need something of ultimate value in my life. Thank you.